It's excitement, it's passion. That's what Mandela Park is. The lights have changed and away they go. It wouldn't be an exaggeration for me to say that Mandela Park changed my life. The adversity in that course was really quite something. Mandela was our academy, it was our mecca. You can go to anywhere after Mandela Brands and Circuit in America, and you have a great grasp for racecraft. Mondello quite literally means little world, and that's what it's become for generations of race fans. I was here from the very beginning. I took it seriously enough that I went out because I wanted to win. Everyone's come through here. Anyone who's anyone in motorcycling in Ireland has been in Mondello Park. The arrival of Ayrton Senna to Mondello Park 1982 was amazing. I'd like to believe that Mondello played a major part in my particular role in motor racing, giving me the start. It all originated back in Mondello. Derek Daly and David Kennedy and John Watson, Tommy Bird. It was a training ground for that. You can't do better than that, can you? <laughs> it's all a result of Mondello. Nothing would have happened if there was no Mondello. In August 2018, Mondello Park celebrated 50 years as the jewel in the crown of Irish motor racing. This is the story of people who dared to dream of a unique place with excitement, passion, and sometimes danger. Built by drivers and fans determined to put Irish motor racing on the map. You have to remember Ireland in the 1960s. If you were interested in sport, your opportunities for entertainment were limited somewhat. You could go to a soccer match, you could go to Gaelic games, maybe horse racing. There weren't too many people interested in rugby and there wasn't a whole lot else. Uh, shopping centres didn't exist to that point. While motor racing was blossoming in other parts of the world in the 1960s, Irish race fans and drivers only had occasional opportunities to sate their hunger for motor racing action. Dublin's Phoenix Park played host to a regular racing festival, and the annual Dunboyne race meeting was the premier showcase for wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. There was so much excitement about going to Dunboyne as, as, a, as a race fan with my family. It was the first time I'd seen what I would have called international motor racing in Ireland. It was really exciting, sitting in the grandstand in the village in Dunboyne, watching the cars coming down into the village and then going through the village. Unbelievable. Dunboyne proved popular with fans, but the danger was not containable. And following four fatalities in three years, the spectacle came to an end in 1966. Stuart Cosgrave was a racer, uh, he was an entrepreneur, he was a man of great energy, and he decided, as a race organiser, someone who had seen too much death in road racing, specifically at the Dunboyne races where he was clerk of the course for several years, he decided that Ireland needed a permanent racing circuit, the time had come. Eddie Regan, who was also a racer and a good friend of Stuart Cosgrave, his brother-in-law, Jim Moran, had a parcel of land that he was looking to offload farmland down near Nace in County Kildare. And so this, this holy uh, trinity was, was created. I remember it well. I remember when it was just a farm. Because my dad was a vet, we used to be out here looking after cattle. And we were so excited when they started talking about building a racetrack. Cosgrave secured sponsorship from Shell, Castrol, Dunlop, Esso and Ford for £5,000 each. A loan and an agreed overdraft were thrown into the mix and contracts to the tune of £40,000 were signed to construct the track. As a kid, I had those Finky toys, I had the Corgi toys, I had a whole collection of racing cars.
couldn't believe when my mother mentioned to me that she heard it was a racing circuit being built in Ireland and it just was nearly unimaginable. We had Kirkuson and that was the only sort of what you might call permanent track. When Mandelo came in, that was, that was the first non-airfield track. Work began on the 18th of December, 1967. Even though there were delays over contracts and difficulties around drainage, the track was ready for action on May 12th, 1968, when the North Point eight mile track was officially opened and ready to host its first public race. The first day this place opened, I was down and marshalling and the traffic jams to get to it. It was absolutely packed. It was breeding a new group of uh, motorsport enthusiasts. Jim Marn, you're one of the three directors of this new circuit. Are you happy what has happened? Very, Michael, yes. 10 to 15,000 people. Is this what you have been aiming at? Well, it's meeting our expectations very well, yes. I actually attended the very first race meeting at Mondello. I just knew from an ad on the radio or the television that they built a new racing circuit in Nace. I walked all the way, traffic jams everywhere, sat by myself, uh, admiring the racing cars and the noise and the color and everything about it. Garage owner John Keeney had the honor of winning the first race at the new Mondello Park circuit in what was just the beginning of a lifelong association with the track. I remember the race. I knew all the guys who were racing. It was great to win the first race, but the significance of it didn't mean anything at the time. It was just a race and it was on to the next race to try and win the next one. The other great thing you had in those days was common classes, north and south. So if there was a race in the south, everyone from the north came south, and vice versa. And it was a very healthy situation, and a situation that uh, we could take a lesson from nowadays. Emerging star John Watson from Belfast went on to win the feature race for single-seaters at that inaugural event. I mean, Mondello was the first permanent racing circuit in the Republic, and it was supported by all the competitors that competed you know, north and south through that period. Watson beat fellow Ulsterman John Pollock to take the checkered flag, and his sheer determination and huge ambition would take him to glory on the world stage. I wanted to have the opportunity to go and challenge based on, I suppose, a dream. Naivety maybe as well, but a dream. I wanted to be a Formula One driver. His success in Formula 2 racing soon propelled Watson to Formula 1, where he joined some of the biggest international stars of the day. Well, as a mate, John's one of the nicest guys you can meet around. You know, he's really, he's a super friend of mine. He's really, really a great guy. As a driver, I also have a very, very high opinion of him. I think he's really good. He's very, very quick. I think John has adapted much faster than any of us anticipated. When Watson held off James Hunt to win the Austrian Grand Prix in 1976, it was a validation of the talent that had blossomed at Dunboyne and Mondello Park. He went on to win five Grand Prix, which remains a towering achievement among Irish racing drivers. There is nothing better in the world to race than a single-seater. A single-seater is the purest racing car form known to man, and I have to say now to women as well. seemed like a man's world, until Rosemary Smith put women in the driving seat. Rosemary Smith came down the ramp with her co-driver, Margaret Lurie. I just loved it. It was the very short circuit at that stage, and it was the time that Eddie Regan and the boys who made it, Jim Moran, in the very beginning, because I was here from the very beginning. I've won the Ladies' Prize in nine different international rallies all over the world. 
I think of years and years ago and coming out here and various people saying, ah, well, you're only a rally driver, so, I mean, to be a racing driver, that's totally different. And I said, great, so I'll, I'll prove to them. So I got the little escort and uh, I just loved it. Rosemary arrived with the guts, the determination and the talent, but getting the respect of her male counterparts would take time. I mean, I've often been asked time and time and time, you know, oh, well, you'd have a separate class. I said, there is a class within a rally, but with the same course as the men do, everything else, and it's when you go out and then you beat them in the same rally. And they used to get quite annoyed with me because, you know, they'd say things like, oh, weren't you very lucky? Or did everybody else fall out? That was just the times. They, they wouldn't dare say it now. They wouldn't dare say it. Women have been racing in Mondello for decades, and they are finally getting due recognition, not least through the efforts of the first all-women's team to compete in the Fiesta six-hour endurance race. I've been around the track all my life. I think there's a picture of me running around a trailer when I was about two. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a great place to be over the years. I was brought up around race, brought up at a circuit, all this, it's nothing new to me and uh, it just feels like home here. There are lots of women around and teaching in Mondello Park as well, I can see more women are getting interested in the sport and they're becoming uh, much more skilled at it as well. It's not just uh, one or two here and there, there's now kind of been a spreading of them, so it's great to see. As the sport's popularity grew, a half-mile extension was added with the construction of the Duckham's Loop. Now 1.16 miles in length, the organisers formed a relationship with the world-famous Brands Hatch Circuit in the UK, bringing in the crowds and securing the sport's future in Ireland. For me, I suppose the earliest days when I came as a kid and, and, and held onto the, the wire, looking over the wire, because all it was that protected you from these cars was just a wire going around the circuit. I remember seeing Fittipaldi and Hunt, and they were spectacular in their car control. They flung the car around, they, they kissed up onto the curb, threw the dirt off, off, off with the wheels spinning as they made their way down the straight. You know, that, they were really evocative moments. Well, of course, the big names came with the Plassels. The biggest name of all, probably, when you look back on it, was Senna, the day Senna came. Welcome back, and now to the highlight of the weekend, the Benson & Hedges Euro Series Final. By eight under silver, hot favourite without a doubt for this race. The late Ayrton Senna, one of the great legends of Formula One. When he first came to Ireland in 1982, he was just an ambitious 21-year-old racer looking to make a name for himself. So the Europeans are well to the fore. Down they come, Greenan on the outside, De Silva on the inside. Known back then under his father's name, De Silva, the early signs of greatness were there for all to see. So it's Green and De Silva, Nissan, Victor De Silva making a bit for the outside. Round the outside of Shell, he doesn't do it. Still... I mean, how many world champions did we have at Mondello? Emerson Fittipaldi raced a Formula Ford. Within 18 months, he had won the US Grand Prix. Mika Hakkinen, twice world champion. Rubens Barrichello raced in Formula Opel Lotus. You always had a sense that when you were watching these visiting classes, that you were potentially watching some of the world's greatest. De Silva nearly had him. This time he's trying again. He's going to try and go around the outside, but there ain't much room there, but he's done it. That was sensational. That's why he is so good. So now I think the race we've got to be quite realistic. Looks as if it's going to be for second place, and what a race that is. You know that he had it in his DNA to be something really special. A very tight and very difficult track, Mondello, so it really sorts the men out from the boys. You can hold on to a, a car at Modelo Park. You can hold on to a car anywhere. At only 21 years of age, he must have an enormous future. He does indeed. Formula One teams are interested. These were incredible drivers, enormously impressive to see these young kids doing incredible things with the car. And you could clearly point your finger and say, this guy's going to be a future world champion. The checkered flag for Aiton de Silva. 
They were just simply fantastic days. And to see them conquer Mondello, you knew that these were going to be future gods. There's De Silva, a face that we're going to know extremely well in the future. And I would be almost certain that a face that we're going to see in Grand Prix racing before very long. Saturday morning at Mondello, about 90 riders make final adjustments to their machines for the Leinster 200, the first ever motorcycle race in the Republic to be staged on a fully enclosed circuit. From the outset, motorcycle racing was an integral part of Mondello's calendar and provided a vital platform for emerging riders. Another talent cultivated on the track at Mondello was Dubliner Eddie Laycock, who made the transition from fan to competitor, progressing to the highest levels of what's now known as MotoGP. It all started really with me back in the early 70s. I was mad on my motorbikes. Even at the age of 10, I was flying around fields on motorbikes and stuff, and I always wanted to get here. I was about 14, I think, in around that age, and I used to cycle out to the nice road and put the thumb out. Every bike that would go by would be thumbing away, and eventually this group of lads stopped. They were coming down to race. They were from the north side of Dublin. They were coming down, they threw me on the back. No helmet, of course, because it wasn't needed back then. I'd come down with them and hang out with them, and there was a little old uh, caravan here that they used to keep the straw bales in that they'd use on the corners. I'd hop into the caravan Saturday night. The lads would go to the pub, leave me here. Once it got dark, they were gone. You'd wake up with mice running around you and all that kind of stuff. You'd get out, watch the race, and the lads would drop me back to my bicycle and I'd pedal home. But that was me besotted with Mondello. I had to get back here on the motorbike myself. So I entered my first race, but you had to be 18 at the time, and of course I wasn't, so I forged my father's signature, came down, and ended up on the podium with a third place, and. Uh, arrived home with a big trophy and he sort of caught the side of the trophy, where were you, and sort of a slap on the back of the hand. But there was one more race meeting left that season and uh, I went up to him and I said, listen, I'm going again. And he said, right, just don't tell your mother. And he signed it and he passed me back the farm and off I went. The pace is set by a group of riders made up of Mark Farmer from Portadown and Dublin Eddie Laycock. And I finished second and he was hiding out in the grandstand. I didn't even know he was here. And that was sort of me done. And after that, I just started competing full time. And there's Eric Galbraith with Eddie Laycock right behind him. Eventually, that led me to the Isle of Man and 37 miles and six lap races. Eddie Laycock flicked his Yamaha through the left and right to Brandon. In 87, I won uh, the Junior TT. So a first TT victory, you must be delighted. I am, I can't believe it, I still don't believe it, Jan. <laughs> Mondello got me everywhere. Following the track extension to a length of 1.1 miles in 1969, Mondello attracted bigger international events and Formula 5000 championship racing was to catapult it to the world stage. I think the, the big memory was the, the great Formula 5000 day, when you had these massively powerful cars trying to squeeze themselves into Mondello. I was at the Formula 5000 race here. There were big crowds then because it was so new. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous, those big machines, you know, roaring down into, into, into the first corner. In sixth place, going to the second leg was the Italian lady, Lella Lombardi, with the Shell Sport Lola. And she is showing the Mondello crowd why she is rated the fastest woman in the world and the only female in the real big-time motor racing. 
Lella, the Tigress of Turin, is a star in her own right. Those Dublin Grand Prix events from 1969 through to 1974 were, were some of the biggest days in Irish motor racing history. Stuart Cosgrave, Eddie Regan and Jim Moran, the three men who established Mondello on a piece of Kildare grassland, had brought the track to the world's attention. It had been a hard road, and with the spectacle of Formula 5000, things could only get bigger, better, and faster. With the track established in international terms, it was time for Irish drivers to make their mark. The 1970s saw a new age of local contenders who dared to dream. I had read the stories of drivers coming through in Formula Ford, so I set a goal to buy a Formula Ford car. And I bought my first Formula Ford car, Lotus 51, for £400, which was really cheap at the time. So I was starting at the very bottom, cars that other people wouldn't race, and I had no chance of success. All I wanted was mileage. The adversity in that course was really quite something. You had cambers that were against you in the corner, that tightened up, that you couldn't see the apex. It's everything you need to be educated, to be a fully qualified race driver. And from the experience I had in Mandela, I could take that anywhere in the world and win. It's David Kennedy who wins. You can't do better than that, can you? <laughs> David Kennedy did something that hadn't been done before and showcased Mondello to the world. He won a British single-seater championship in 1976, and that was the first time that an Irishman had won. The implication of that was this racetrack was capable of producing racers of the very highest caliber. To take the checkered flag, David Kennedy, two hands there. He launched his career. He went on to race with the, uh, the Works March Formula 3 team in the European championship and raced with distinction, was able to beat on occasion the likes of Nelson Piquet, Alan Prost. There they go, and it's Kennedy who gets it beautifully off the line. Then he moved again, into the British Formula One championship, some of those races featured on live television, which was a novelty uh, back in the 1970s. This is the story of the 1979 Aurora AFX Formula One championship and the battle between two aspiring young race drivers, Rupert Keegan and David Kennedy, his nickname was Kamikaze Kennedy. His car, he painted it black and he painted his helmet black because he wanted to intimidate other drivers. David, what are the feelings as you come to Silverstone to this final round? Um, I very much intend to win the race. He was an exceptionally talented driver and also a fiercely determined one. And David Kennedy appears to be making a challenge. He is, he's alongside Keegan, and he's trying to go through on the inside as they approach the chicane, and they touch, and they spin off, and Kennedy goes deep into the catch fencing. That propelled David into the World Formula One Championship in 1980. Unfortunately, the team that he went uh, to, the shadow team, was itself a bit of a shadow of its former self. It was in the doldrums, so David's uh, career in Formula One was uh, short-lived, but it did springboard him into a sports car racing career of great distinction. Raced at Le Mans, class winner on numerous occasions. And I think probably the best photograph I've seen of, of the drivers from Mandela was Le Mans in the 80s. Myself, Kenny Atchison, John Watson, Derek, we had Mickey Rowan at Works Austin Martin. It was incredible. <laughs> we really populated um, at the higher echelons of motorsport. Mondello's Ulster contingent, Kenny Atchison, Martin Donnelly, and Eddie Irvine, all excelled at the very top level of motorsport. Donnelly was on the crest of a wave with the Lotus team in Formula One when his career came to a premature end. Martin Donnelly probably would have been ultimately the one that might have achieved most, and tragically he had an appalling accident in Jerez in 1990, and that ended his career. Since its opening in 1968, Mondello Park had provided the only outlet for Irish racing drivers with the talent to shine in international competition. But by 1985, 
Ireland was a country in financial crisis, and Mondello became one of its casualties. With the other two initial investors now out of the picture, Stuart Cosgrave tried to carry on alone, but soon the liquidators stepped in, and, reluctantly, a consortium of clubs bought out the interests. My first sponsor was Stuart Cosgrave, the owner of Mondello Park, and it was very, very sad to see that he lost basically his business baby and, and what he had given birth to was a vast number of uh, careers in the business and in the world of motorsport. I spoke to my colleague Martin Borain, who was a very successful entrepreneur in the UK from Mayo, and I told Martin about this. And Martin said, I must look at this because he was a keen racing fan. Burain, a highly motivated, self-made man, started life as an actor. So I got the job. Well, that's fine. And as you ask my advice, I'll tell you that in show business, like everything else, a smart appearance does help. He had since become a successful entrepreneur with a thriving business empire. Away from the boardroom, his passion was motor racing. He was a frequent competitor at the Le Mans 24 Hours. The realization of a dream because when I started racing, and I was thinking of Le Mans, and I was thinking, I'd never get that. But he did in the end. In 1990, he raced to a new Irish land speed record on the M50 motorway before its official opening to the public. Martin Baran actually reached 178 miles an hour on one run. The average was 172.27. So will you have another go at uh, reaching the 200 miles an hour? Yes. Where? Well, I don't know, when I find a venue. Mondello and Irish Motorsport had found an enthusiastic saviour. Martin decided to invest and um, buy Mondello Park, and it gave it its second life. He stood up when not a lot of people would and said, I'm willing to invest some of my hard-earned money in this facility so as we keep it alive in Ireland. It was in a very sad, sad state. I decided to uh, go to Ireland and play with Mandela Park and finish it off as a proper international track. When Martin took over the venue, it was always his idea that we would have an international standard motorsport venue in Ireland. So we started that planning process in the mid-90s. Uh, we applied for planning permission to extend the circuit out to three and a half kilometres, and that was opened in 1998. And then further to that then, he went on to develop the facilities around the venue. So there was the redevelopment of the pits and extension of the paddock and also to bring us up to what we called an FIA Grade 2 standard, licence standard, which would mean that the venue would be capable of hosting anything except Formula One. Now that from a circuit that started as a bit of tarmac in the field back in 1968 was, was a phenomenal uh, ambition. There had been a bank of seats at what used to be Dunlop Corner, uh, but that was a bank of benches really. It was useful to have it, but the grandstand was a substantial addition. and the tower for the track. That, that really brought it to a point where the spectators could get as much out of the racing as you could possibly get. It wouldn't be an exaggeration for me to say that Mondello Park changed my life. I mean, it gave me the start that I would never have had if it wasn't there. Well, Derek, you've just come in now from, uh, from this particular practice lab. What separates a race driver from the ordinary fellow who drives a saloon car and thinks he does it pretty well? I think the main thing is the fact that if you're willing to take a chance, Eric Daly came through stock cars. He raced down in Santry and Old Bangers. He did them up to sate this urge to go as fast as he possibly can and to control a motor vehicle at speed. And Derek Daly, of course, was uh, David Kennedy's good friend. The two worked together, and he, in, in some ways, was David Kennedy's mechanic in those early days as much as any of them. He then himself had to get on the grid, and when he did, his, uh, his rise was fairly meteoric. Learning your trade at a place like Mondello gave us the confidence to try what it might be like in England. When we won there, let's go to Europe, and then the rocket ship really took off. Our next guest was last on the show about two years ago, and we sent him away to join the big time in the motor racing business. 
Less than two years after leaving Mondello, Derek Daly was racing Formula One cars with the British Formula Three Championship under his belt. He led his first Formula One race in 1978 and scored an impressive points finish at the Canadian Grand Prix that year. Dublin's Derek Daly, highly tipped as the future champion. This success heralded a move to the US in 1983, where he forged a career in IndyCar racing. A year later, he miraculously survived a horrific crash at Michigan, but was back racing at the Indy 500 within a year. OK, now, can I show them just a few photographs of the crash, first of all? That was the first impact, when the, when the front of the car was completely wiped off. When the front came off the car, as I went along the road, I probably went another quarter of a mile with my foot out, and it, it rubbed my heel off on the right foot. Now, the left one, I lost a toe. Um, I broke my leg in four places. It broke my hip joint, pushed my leg into the hip joint, broke that, broke my pelvis in four places, broke my hand in four places, broke a rib, lacerated the liver, got a third degree on my arm, got a bang in the head. Bang in the head didn't affect me. <laughs> Mondello has always been an environment where families and racing dynasties thrived. And Derek's brother, Vivian Daly, also established himself in the local racing community. He raced here for probably more than 20 years. He was pretty determined, you know, he ran himself, didn't want to run for a team, was able to do it all, you know, he was the truck driver, the mechanic, the engineer, and the race driver. So uh, it was quite amazing what he, what he achieved when you think about it now. I'd say my first and earliest memories of Mandela would have to be the atmosphere. You know, coming down here every weekend since I was born, it was just the paddock was full, you know, stands were full, you'd have flags flying, it was just a great place to be in the weekends, and it was the only place we knew at the weekend was to come to Mundello to watch my dad race. I remember coming down here with my wife and my parents. We were married only a very short while at the time. In the summer of 1968, to see motor racing here, we had a picnic on the grass behind where the grandstand is now. We had sandwiches and we drank red wine, and the motor racing was great. So ever since then, I've come here as often as I possibly can. Well, that's always been something about Mandela Park, that it is, it's open and it's a friendly venue. You can walk around the paddock on a race day, you can chat to drivers. It is a wonderful piece of serendipity, isn't it? Because Mondello quite literally means little world, and that's what it's become for generations of race fans. Of course, every would-be race driver has to start somewhere. And here at the Mondello track, there is a special course for training racing drivers. Um, as I've already told you about the routes. Probably the most famous man from Mondello, obviously, Eddie Jordan. And I mean, what Eddie has achieved from Mondello Park, from these little beginnings, to end up with a team that could take on Ferrari, take on McLaren, chase for the world championship. His best success actually in Mondello happened in the Formula Atlantic series, particularly in 1978. He won the 1978 Formula Atlantic Championship, he won the Leinster Trophy that year, and that was the springboard to move him into Britain, where he raced and went immediately into the British Formula 3 series. <laughs> Mondello Park, wonderful, wonderful memories. It does make me feel somewhat a bit old. But I remembered the early days with Eddie Regan when he set it up and we all thought he was a little bit crazy. I was one of the first to go there and do kart racing because that was what everyone did when they wanted to get on the ladder for Formula One. And that was always the dream. But coming out of Ireland and thinking about such things, was it a reality? I think it was more of a dream. But it happened for some of us and we were very pleased about that. In fact, they were the dream days. You know, it gave us endless amounts of top quality, fantastic professional drivers who all emerged and came out of Mondello. 
But it wasn't just that, it was the queue of people from NACE to come and see it because I think Ireland became infatuated by motor racing and the excitement. It was not just in Formula Ford, but saloon cars, and then, of course, Formula 5000 came, and we got major European and international races there. So I think what Mondello has delivered for sport, not just motorsport, in Irish history, Irish folklore, has been simply sensational. And Eddie Jordan's journey to Formula One was no less sensational. The arch dealmaker gathered the crew that created the glorious Jordan team, which burst on the scene in 1991, and by 1998, he and his team had reached the pinnacle of the sport they loved. Here he comes now, the checkered flag falls for the Jordan team. Damon Hill takes victory here in Belgium. It's second place for Jordan as well. Ralph Schumacher coming home in second place. There is the most pleased man in world motorsport at the moment. He's finally done it. Our two Jordan cars kept Irish smile, eyes smiling. I'd like to believe that Mondello played a major part in my particular role in motor racing, giving me the start. It was a dream beginning. It's been a dream life, actually. And it all originated back in Mondello. Times change, and in more recent years, the fast and ever-changing world of motorsport has another spectacular event that draws massive crowds. Drifting. Huge, powerful machines amid huge clouds of smoke make this the fastest growing form of motorsport on the planet. Drifting started about 15 years ago in Ireland. It's uh, an influence from Japan. <laughs> Drifting is essentially controlling a power slide through a designated course. Now you're seeing upwards of 10,000 come to an event to watch it. I mean, these kids are coming in at 14 years of age, 15 years of age, and they're beating the best in the world. Not just in Ireland, in the world. Mandela Park has the most belief in the sport of drifting than any other race circuit I've ever had any encounters with. Without Mandela Park believing, it definitely wouldn't be where it is now. We're sharing the day with the IDC, the Irish Drift Championship, and today is uh, round two of the IRX Irish Rallycross Championship. World-renowned rallycross driver Derek Toel has added his name to the long list of Mondello-bred Irish champions. I'm driving a Ford Fiesta four-wheel drive supercar, about 650 brake horsepower, and does not to 100 in about 1.8 seconds. So that accelerates the Formula One car. You know you're alive when you're in it. Well, I was dragged down here as a kid. I remember a European Rallycross Championship used to come here. I seen a lot of heroes. I just couldn't believe the power of the cars. And from that day, I said, someday, that's going to be me. Going back to the early 70s, the driving school in Mandela was really important for developing young racing talent. To this day now, we still have that school there for, for young drivers to come through, to learn their trade. People can come and sit in a single seat race car and drive around the circuit that out and send a drove around. It's not very often that you get to be able to say that. The checkered flag for Antoine de Sena. To come here and to be able to sit into a single seat or drive around at this circuit, and it's an absolutely fantastic experience. Hopefully we'll find the next great talent to come through the Irish ranks and to, to fly the fight for Irish motorsport.
of the many stars to emerge from Mondello, when it came to winning hearts, minds and races, one name stood out from all others. For me, without question, um, with Tommy Byrne. <sighs> what do you want to know? <laughs> when people look at me, I'm 24 and I look a bit younger and I'm very good at what I do and I'm not afraid to see it. Tommy was truly exceptional. If anyone could have taken Senna on or Hakkinen on or any of the greats with Tommy Byrne, he, he just had it in his fingertips. He didn't even have to work at it. And, and to some way, that was galling. A friend of mine, Pat McConnell, he went to the school in Mandela Park, the racing school. And I said to him, how much did it cost? He said, he said it was 20 pounds for 20 laps or something. And I said, did I ask you for your license? He said, no because I didn't have a license at the time. We took my driver's license, actually, to get a competition license from Mandelo Park. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So I went up there a couple of weeks later, got a lift up there with somebody and went, went through that school. And that was the first time I seen Mandelo. And once I did my 20 laps, and that was it. I was, I was hooked on racing. Tommy Byrne's talent was there for all to see, and it wasn't long before that talent would blossom on the international stage. And there is the man to watch, Tommy Byrne from Dundalk in Ireland. Byrne was hot property in the early 80s. Tommy Byrne is in a class of his own. Victory in British Formula Ford, European Formula Ford 2000, and the 1982 British Formula 3 title made him the most prolific up-and-coming star on the British racing scene. Tommy Byrne, who I would think has got a great motor racing future in front of him. His talent was self-evident. I mean, the man just had no inhibitions, inside or outside of the cockpit. Came back to Mandela uh, to race in the EFTA Formula Ford 2000 Championship. And People have to like you, and you have to keep winning. You win the race on, on a Sunday, you get on the phone Monday, it's a lot easier to get stuff done. The checkered flag for Tommy Byrne. So well done, Tommy Byrne, an excellent race. In 1983, Tommy claimed the British Formula 3 championship, bringing him one step closer to every young driver's holy grail, Formula 1. And it is Tommy Byrne, the winner. I think we love the champagne, that. Huh? It's a good idea, actually. Hey, 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 that champagne is for when you win your first Formula One, Tommy. <laughs> oh, you just leave that there. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> 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 Sadly, although tipped by Eddie Jordan and others as a future Grand Prix superstar, Tommy's career in Formula One was a short one. A working class lad who lived as fast off the track as he did on it was always an outsider in the world of the rich sporting elite. Of course, the story then came apart at the seams. It probably was too much too soon. Probably hadn't got the management that he required and certainly the background that he had didn't help him. I think when People gather in pubs to decide who was the greatest ever. Tommy Byrne's name probably appears at the top of the list more often than others. You can't go through life having regrets, and, and I don't. I had a good time. You know, I didn't exactly get to where I wanted to uh, money-wise, but um, I had a good time. You know, I, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. I had a, I had a good life. Following a massive financial investment and the extension of the track to 3.5 kilometers, Mondello was finally ready to compete with the UK and European circuits. The Toyota European Boss race for Formula One cars here at the International Circuit of Mondello. It allowed us the opportunity to go and pitch for some of those big uh, international championships. And between 2000 and 2007, I mean, that, that was a, the modern golden era, if you like. Right through the early 2000s, we had uh, championships come over from the UK. We had British touring cars. Touring cars was terrific. We brought them in first in 2001. In 2003, we were the opening round of the touring car championship, which was, a, I thought, was a huge feat for Modelo. We had crowds of upwards of 20,000 here to see British superbikes over that period. 
in 2003. Our superbikes had a, a, a slot going, and quick as a light, uh, Martin jumped in and said, look, we can do that in, in Mondello. And I'll never forget standing at the top of the tower on the morning and just watching the streams of people coming in the gates. The sun was splitting the trees and it was magic. The organizers of, of superbikes loved it as well, and word was filtering back to the UK that it was a good place to come. All the competitors loved coming here. I think many people would consider the greatest racing event we ever ran, certainly on the car side, but it would have been the FIA Sports Car Championship in 2001. Side by side, can the Lola go through? No, Warren Carway fends him off, Warren locks up, scrambles around the corner. Fantastic! And I think that was a particularly special event for Martin. He had such a, an interest in sports car racing, having raced at Le Mans for many years. Martin, a very proud day for you here. Yes, indeed. Not, not since 1931 has there been this quality of a race in Ireland, and we're delighted to have it. Charlotte Mara, Baldi and Alex, Cathy Sher, and Jan Lambert dives up the inside for the lead, and through he goes. Great move there. Fantastic bit of driving. Jan so when that ro rolled in here in 2001 for a two and a half hour race, it was absolutely out of this world. Many of Mondello's treasured memories are now preserved at the on-site museum, which includes an impressive collection of Martin Burain's cars. I mean, sports cars, uh, world endurance cars, some really important iconic pieces of motorsport history. And we really encourage people to go in and have a look at that. It gives you a feel for how motorsport has changed over the years. And uh, it's a collection of cars that were really important to Martin. June 2018, Martin Burain, Mondello's own guardian angel, passed away. His death at 82 was sudden, unexpected, and it came as he was planning Mondello's 50th anniversary race meeting. This is the close one. He did a lot of creative things there, and other people in the motor racing business appreciated. And I'm very sad that he's passed away. He was, he was a great man, uh, and his vision for this place was terrific. His drive and his commitment to make the 50th anniversary race meeting uh, a massive success was huge. And ultimately, the, the event became a tribute to Martin instead of an event that he could enjoy himself. He leaves a lasting legacy in Mondello Park. We always wanted to grow and develop the place for young drivers, for motorsport people to come and enjoy their passion. No, I know Martin's not here maybe to keep an eye on it firsthand, but I think he'd be very proud of the way it's going at the moment. So in memory of Martin Brain, and then ladies and gentlemen, start your engine. <laughs> After many years away, Tommy Byrne returned for the anniversary celebrations and discovered that in Irish motor racing, once a hero means always a hero. I don't know, I've never seen nothing like this before. I would never have envisioned 1976 when I started here at Mondello and be back here at 60 years of age driving James Hunt's uh, Formula One number one Heskin. I haven't put my lily white arse in one of these in 30 odd years. I thought I would never ever drive a fully fledged real racing car again around here. This is really what lit the fire, the enthusiasm for kids of my vintage when I came on the other side of the fence looking at those cars. It was just an extraordinary experience and maybe somewhere out here another kid's enthusiasm has been lit to follow the world of motor racing. And a really important thing for us now is to grow and diversify for young drivers, for motorsport people to come and enjoy their passion. To have a permanent circuit in the Republic is a great tribute to Martin and to all those that are working tirelessly to ensure that it's in perpetuity for future competitors. There he is, Eddie Laycock. This is where I started. The checkered flag for Tommy Bird. I loved the track. It was just the place to go if you want to be a race car driver. I ate on the silver. It's here at Mandela. Well, of course, the big names came, and uh, we can be very proud of ourselves. 
thanks to Mandelo. This is a really good dice, which is what brings people to Mandelo every other race meeting. Great, great memories, dearly implanted in my heart forever. Mondello, I applaud you. Fantastic. <laughs>